I was asked um, earlier this morning if I was preaching on the second lesson, uh, the letter to the second letter to the Corinthians. Uh, and I said, oh God, no. <laughs> and then our interpreter said, what is the third heaven? And I said, I don't know, God knows. So uh, yeah, we're not, I don't, I don't, I have nothing to say on that um, uh, today at all. So sorry. Um, uh, yes, I, nothing to say on that. But what I do want to talk a little bit about is here on the, uh, the end of Independence Day weekend. I'd like to talk a little bit about Independence Day and the church. So you're going to get a bit of a history lesson, and I know it's warm, and I will try to move through this, move through this quickly. We were part of the Church of England. That didn't go so well for us in 1776. Following the War of Independence, we weren't part of the Church of England anymore. So the question became, what do we do? And so the Anglicans in the 13 colonies got together to try to figure out what, uh, what this meant. Because we're descendants of a state church. We are no longer part of the state church. So what of the state, so what does that mean for us? And so there were great debates over, over this. And, but one thing became clear, we, we, needed, uh, we needed a bishop because you need bishops to make clergy. So uh, we needed a bishop. Now England was really not interested in talking to us. Understandably, they, they were not too thrilled with us. So off to Scotland we went. And we were ordained by, we had a Samuel Seabury was uh, from Connecticut, was ordained the first bishop in the Episcopal Church uh, of the United States, and he was ordained in Scotland, at the, the, um, the Church of Scotland, the Episcopal Church of Scotland. It's where we get Episcopal from. Some time later, the Church of England decided, okay, you can, you're, you're kind of like our annoying cousins, so we are gonna ordain some bishops for you. And they, we sent over William White of Pennsylvania and Samuel Provost of New York to be ordained. Now we had to go somewhere, because remember, it takes three bishops to make one bishop. So the church does interesting things with men. Uh, so White and Provost come back and we're in this debate. We're realizing we need a prayer book, right? Because we have the 1662 Book of Common Prayer which was what everyone was, was used to in the colonies, in the Anglican, uh, those in the Anglican tradition at least. And the problem was you were praying for the king, which we weren't doing anymore. We were praying, we took that prayer out, of course. Actually taking that prayer out during the revolution was not only a treasonous act, um, but was an act of disloyalty to your ordination vows, because if you're ordained in the Church of England, you take an oath of loyalty to the monarch who is the head of the Church of England. So it was kind of a radical thing to do even then. So they pull the prayer, they pull the prayer for the monarch out, and we start to put this new prayer book together. And the prayer book's proposed in 1785, 1786, and in it, there is a service for July 4th which is to be used on that day in perpetuity. And, at, and it really was to be attached to morning or evening prayer, had special readings, a special canticle was said, and a, this beautiful prayer for the nation was, was, was in it. We're getting to 1789, the first prayer book's about to be approved, and Provost and White say, you know what, there's still plenty of loyalists in the country right now. Um, still plenty of people loyal to the crown and they're smarting still about this. Uh, let's not celebrate this, this July 4th service. Let's not have it in the prayer. Let's take it out of the proposed, proposed prayer book. So we have this, this idea that's pulled out of the prayer book. It was only used once publicly that we're aware of by John Henry Hobart, who was Bishop of New York. Uh, actually, Hobart was the one who consecrated the first St. Paul's uh, uh, upon its founding. Uh, he then went to Auburn and died. 
There's something to be said about the, how far the, the, how tenuous it is for bishops uh, in, in, in this part of the state. Uh, it's a deeply rooted. Sorry, John. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, so Hobart was the only one who reported to use this. 1892 comes around, we add some prayers for the nation. We don't really do anything for it. It's not in there. 1928 comes around, uh, sort of building off the nationalism of post-World War I age. We add readings and a prayer for our nation that could be used on July 4th, if we want. In 1979, we elevate that day to the equivalent of a major feast. So if we were to look, if you were to open your prayer books to page 18 or so, you'll see all these lists of dates that we keep, apostles, evangelists, uh, all the sort of the big saints. So St. Mark, St. Luke, St. John, uh, St. Matthew, St. Mary Magdalene, the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, all of these folks are kept in there. And we have two national days, Thanksgiving and Independence Day. And what we've said is that these readings and prayers trump anything else that happens that day except if it's a Sunday. And so we've elevated this, this national day to the equivalent of a major feast. So we've gone from saying, let's not talk about it, let's, not, let's just say our prayers for our nation, to if you are having a service this day, these are, the pr this, these are the readings that you use, and this is the prayer that is to be said. So what then is July 4th to a Christian? Now, that may sound like a familiar question to you, because Frederick Douglass asked that question slightly differently, much differently, uh, here in Rochester in 1852 at Corinthian Hall, which used to stand where the parking lot outside the Holiday Inn is downtown. Uh, and in a great speech, he asked, what then is July 4th to a slave? What then to a slave is July 4th? In 1852, speaking to a room full of people saying, you celebrate July 4th. There's this great day of independence. He ties it to what we call the pa part of the Paschal mystery, the, the freeing of the people of Israel uh, from the bondage and slavery in Egypt to moving to the land of promise, passing over from uh, slavery to freedom and the Paschal mystery from death to life. He ties it to that and says, this is a day of great rejoicing for you, but what is it to a slave? What is it to someone who does not have their freedom? Calling into question the religion and politics of the time. Calling them to task. And he goes on to say, This country notoriously hates and glories in their hatred of the black man. Notoriously hates and glories in the hatred. Notoriously hates and glories in their hatred. Quite an indictment. Sometimes things don't always change. We look at the world around us and we, we see a world, a, a nation at times, a church at times that glories in their hatred. It's easy to find, you turn on your television, you can open your social media, we see people glorying in their hatred of, of someone of a difficult, different political party, of particular candidates, of particular types of people, of things or people or ideas that they don't understand, and they glory in it. They take pride in their hatred, even. And they call it American, and they call it Christian. And then we have a church that says, Independence Day is a major feast. So what then is July 4th to a Christian? So I go back to that 1786 Book of Common Prayer, where it says, which I wish they had kept this prayer. There was this, a beautiful prayer, and it's printed in, the, in full in this month's edition of the, of the epistle, if you've read it. But the prayer closes out 
by saying, may we improve the abundant blessings, improve the abundant blessings of liberty, religion, and science till the desert blossom like a rose. May we improve on the abundant blessings that we are given. Independence Day is a day, as in the church, like any day, where any time we gather together uh, as people of God, where we hear the word of God proclaimed, where we recognize, so I am going to touch on the second lesson, Kitty, where we recognize the thorn of our sin that is in our side, where we recognize the hatred that exists in our lives, the hatred that we glory in, where we recognize that sin whether it's our individual sin, the church's sin, or the corporate sin of, of the world around us, and where we recognize that sin, and where we then seek to recognize the blessings of God, not just see and, and give thanks for the blessings of God, but improve the abundant blessings of God in the world around us. And we do that with, through the words of the opening prayer. By loving God and loving neighbor. Our prayer for today calls us to be a community that loves God and loves neighbor. And because we follow the one who is love incarnate, who we'll sing about at the offertory, at the offertory hymn. Make the love of God known in the world about us. It may seem like an incredibly daunting task. What can I possibly do to stop anything that goes on in the world? But we as Christians are called to be witnesses to God's love, to be witnesses of God's grace, to strive as hard as we can to improve the abundant blessings of God in all that we do, in all that we say, and make God's grace and mercy and love known. That is what the Christian life is about. That is what Independence Day means to us. That is why the church has raised it up for us to keep. Remind us that we should always be working to, as we will sing in the closing hymn, uh, mend thine every flaw. Men are every flaw and be people of God's love and mercy and grace in the world. To the solitary places and the desert places blossom like a rose. Amen.